a fourth session. And, uh, and the title of the fourth session would be Trans-Pacific Partnership and uh, Prospects for an FTAP. There are two uh, panelists, Mr. Yoshihiro Watanabe, advisor, Bank of Tokyo Mitsubishi UFJ Limited, as well as APEC Business Advisory Council member of Japan. He is an incumbent member of ABAC. And uh, uh, the other one is uh, Mr. Jeffrey Schott, senior fellow at the Peterson Institute. And uh, as uh, this uh, one, uh, there is one discussant, Mr. Peter Petrie. He, he is with uh, Carl J. Shapiro, professor of international finance. Uh, Brandeis University and Senior Fellow, East West Center. And now, uh, Mr. Watanabe, uh, please. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very grateful to have an opportunity to share my views and of Japanese business on Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, or uh, TPP. Uh, Japan's uh, business circles are well aware of its strategic importance for Japan. Uh, we are also aware of political difficulties uh, related to the in uh, inclusion of primary industries. We are now urging our government to start negotiations for accession. I also, uh, would like to ask uh, uh, our U.S. counterpart to support Japan's accession. Two weeks ago, I, together with two other Japan APEC Business Advi Advisory Council member, uh, visited our Prime Minister, uh, Mr. Khan, asking uh, to start negotiation to enter uh, TPP. As uh, uh, the APEC Business Advisory Council for ABAC, uh, let me start with a brief review of this year's ABAC activities before uh, discussing the TPP. Uh, excuse me, how to... <laughs> uh, as you may aware, uh, ABAC created in 1996 to make uh, uh, ABAC members to recommendations from business viewpoint to ministers and leaders of APEC. We have uh, just uh, uh, concluded uh, this year's APEC 21 economies business consulted uh, recommendations to ministers and uh, leaders. Uh, Japanese ABAC members uh, started uh, discussions with our counterpart from Singapore and United States on developing uh, multi-year agenda for APEC uh, Advisory Council at the end of 2008. During this year, uh, Japan has been building Japan's agenda on last year's Singapore agenda. And we are now uh, launching several initiatives uh, that will be carried on next year under uh, US leadership of the uh, ABAC process. Uh, the key issues uh, for ABAC 2010, uh, we have a, a theme of working towards sustainable growth for all. But before then, uh, we need to make an assessment of Bogor goal achievement. And uh, uh, we are pursuing further advancing regional economic integration uh, toward FTWAP. Uh, 
and uh, growth strategy. Uh, in the fields of uh, finance, uh, we ask the APEC officials to kickstart uh, various uh, initiatives. Uh, these include, uh, for example, financial inclusion initiative, a small, medium, and uh, micro enterprise finance initiative, uh, infrastructure finance initiative, green finance initi initiative, and uh, financial products passporting initiative, among others. As uh, chair of uh, ABAC Finance Economic Working Group, I have focused on compiling our proposals to, for finance ministers on regional financial integration and financial market capacity building in support of growth strategy. Uh, just a week uh, before Yokohama uh, Leaders uh, Week, there will be a, a finance minister's meeting in Kyoto. Uh, ABAC will have an opportunity uh, to have a working lunch session with finance ministers to have a dialogue on financial capacity building in the region. Uh, we have discussed Bogor goal assessment very positively, and uh, uh, we have discussed what should be for ABAC uh, uh, to pursue beyond uh, Bogor goal. Uh, we reached, after a heated discussion, that conclusion that uh, APEC need a new vision to maintain its relevance uh, and momentum toward further uh, economic integration. The new vision uh, should be based on achievement of the Bogor goal, but the scope and depth of its contents uh, should address today's challenges and continuously changing APEC business environment. And FTWAP is at the core of the, uh, the new vision. There are different, different pathways uh, to FTAP, and TPP is one. Our recommendation on APEC leaders uh, meeting uh, Chair uh, Mr. Khan, our Prime Minister, uh, is to adopt a new vision for APEC to enhance economic integration. ABAC's 21 economies members unanimously acknowledged uh, TPP as one of pathways uh, in our recommendation. Uh, Japan's Economic Social Research Institute and uh, Japan's Cabinet Office made an impact study of FTWAP and released its result last August. There are so many studies of this kind, and the uh, uh, impact is different from uh, one to one. Uh, generally, the scope of a study is focused on trade in goods and or agriculture and manufacturing, but not so much on services. With respect to Japan, uh, the results are mixed. We stand to lose in agriculture and benefit in manufacturing. In APEC-wide, uh, last year's APEC study showed uh, $527 billion of gain uh, across the APEC. Uh, this uh, chart shows uh, political difficulties for Japan. Uh, this year, uh, June, Kedan Ren uh, released a pu uh, public report on Japan's responsibility as chair of APEC. Uh, Kedan Ren is urging uh, Japan's accession to TPP. 
uh, con contents of FTWP is our business concern. This uh, two-dimensional chart represent the comprehensive needs of business for a more integrated marketplace in the APEC region. The two arrows uh, which I ad added represent expansion of scope and deepening of business needs. FTWP should cover WTO plus issues to enable APEC economies to further open their uh, service industries. We have a series of uh, concrete uh, uh, recommendations like uh, expansion of APEC, APEC business travel, travel card for business persons mobility or like for security of uh, goods uh, authorized economic operators uh, initiative and uh, uh, like uh, uh, green growth uh, related uh, environment goods and service special incentives and so and so. Uh, bilateral FTAs are flourishing across many APEC economies, but in East Asia, the so-called noodle ball phenomenon is undermining the aim of FTAs. Uh, last uh, uh, impact study I showed uh, consists of uh, uh, trade liberalization plus facilitation but other uh, things like uh, uh, to make uh, a very simple or single or root of origin uh, issues, those uh, will have a very big Im impact. And now uh, we are seeking a region-wide FTA or a, a regional trade agreement. ASEAN uh, is its half. But among major spokes, Japan, China, and Korea, so far no FTA has been concluded in spite of many discussions. Our business in general prefers wider regional agreements. And the idea is, uh, of course, uh, conclusion of WTO Doha development agenda, but uh, it has stalled. Uh, products from China, Japan, and Korea are complementing each other through value chains rather than competing, I think. But uh, there are discussions, uh, studies, but no or real negotiation has been concluded. Uh, we have many uh, difficult issues, and also we need to include like IPR, competition policy, government procurement, dispute settlement, and labor and environmental issues, among others. Um, FTA based on ASEAN plus three or six cannot be achieved without an agreement among those uh, three countries. Uh, the TPP can be expanded to become a high standard and a very comprehensive building block toward an APEC-wide FTWP. Uh, Japan's accession depends on handling of uh, agricultural issues, which will inevitably indu induce structural reform of the industry. Uh, food security and safety are major issues in today's world. I personally believe Japanese agriculture can become competitive based on its reputation of safety and quality. Uh, the result of study on FTWP impact on GDP for Japan is not necessarily very encouraging at uh, first look. I believe that uh, APEC should move forward with regional integration of services and capacity building for development through economic and technical cooperation. Then uh, impact gain 
of FTWAP or TPP for Japan will be very big. Uh, TPP can become a tool for Japan to pursue further growth, adapting to uh, present uh, world and streng strengthening uh, Japan's alliance with United States. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for uh, all the support you have given us in our, our work in helping us uh, uh, put together this, uh, uh, this important conference. We greatly appreciate the relationship we have with the Japan Economic Foundation. I also want to thank uh, my colleagues Barbara Kochwar and Julia Mir, who uh, have, uh, uh, are helping me on our studies on the Trans-Pacific Partnership and uh, uh, put together uh, this PowerPoint presentation uh, to try to inform me on what we're doing. Uh, hopefully I will be able to translate it and, uh, and inform you as well. And I think as, uh, in addition, uh, I need to give thanks to one person whose uh, work always goes unheralded in these conferences, but uh, who has uh, benefited everyone in this, in this room, and that is uh, Yvonne Priestley and the Peterson Institute Meetings Department. Uh, they have worked very, very hard over uh, many weeks uh, to ensure that everything runs smoothly and that you are well fed and uh, uh, well cared for. And I want to personally thank her uh, for that. Uh, my topic is getting to the FTAAP via the TPP Turnpike. Uh, uh, it's uh, essentially a way of uh, spelling out many of the th themes that we were already discussing in the very rich uh, 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 presentations we had this morning, uh, where we talked about the, the, the origins of the exercise from the uh, uh, Bogar Declaration uh, through to the various options for moving from, uh, to uh, a Asia-Pacific uh, uh, economic uh, integration arrangement, the ASEAN-centric uh, 10 plus 1 and 10 plus 3 agreements, uh, the Japanese hybrid of that uh, model, which is essentially adds Australia, New Zealand, and India uh, to a 10 plus 3 model, and uh, then the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, which is following a type of agglomeration uh, uh, strategy. Uh, and we've discussed in great detail uh, the membership issue, which I will return to uh, in a moment. Now, who are these countries? And uh, it, I think it's worth at least a minute to look at some very basic statistics that underscore some of the problems that Mark and Barbara and others have in trying to put this deal together. Uh, because when you, you look at the, at, at, the, uh, uh, at the basic data, uh, for the uh, eight uh, core participants and the five countries that uh, we have been discussing that uh, are ripe for participation, uh, if not immediately, then in the near, near future, uh, we see uh, that there are a couple of outliers. Most of the countries are relatively uh, 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 well-to-do, but there's a great divergence in terms of size, level of development, and attitudes towards political rights and civil liberties. Uh, so you have high and middle income uh, countries, but Vietnam really sit, uh, sticks out as an outlier in all categories except population. And indeed, because of its, its large population, it underscores the, the difficulties uh, of, of uh, addressing the development aspects uh, that Barbara mentioned uh, this morning. Uh, so it's really important, but also difficult to come up with the type of development provisions that will uh, uh, allow the uh, uh, implementation and enforcement of a variety of provisions, uh, whether one is dealing with transparency of, of, uh, of uh, uh, obligations, public participation in rulemaking proceedings, dispute settlement, labor, and the environment. Uh, indeed, the entire regulatory coherence agenda uh, raises a question of whether the poorer countries will have the necessary administrative 
capabilities to reach the level of a, uh, of a uh, uh, high, high standard 21st century uh, uh, agreement. Less so in the, care, in the case of the traditional trade agreement where you're talking about uh, liberalizing goods and more so in the area of services and the uh, additional uh, new areas that really uh, create major problems for uh, international flows of trade and investment. And so I've, I've mentioned some of these points here, but I think it's very useful to take that first look at the development indicators. Uh, now, if we uh, include the larger number, and this is a point that's been, been raised, uh, the larger number of countries, we see that it creates a big expansion in the size of the market and, uh, and, and uh, the uh, wealth of the marketplace. And so there is a good economic argument uh, for enlargement. And indeed, that, as Barbara and, and Mark explained, is the ultimate goal anyway in the TPP. And uh, the sooner, the better in terms of reaping the economic benefits. And uh, I know Peter Petri will have a few words to say about his uh, work uh, estimating those, those, those benefits. Uh, on the trade side, it's also worth looking at some general statistics uh, just to sort of get well grounded. Uh, the TPP core countries, uh, when you look at the uh, total amount of goods and services exports, the numbers are rather small once you take out the United States, uh, but become much more significant uh, when you add uh, the ad uh, additional uh, core countries. Uh, with, with the uh, 13 countries added together, you come up with total uh, uh, goods trade that in the area of 35 to 40 percent of world trade, and services trade, exports and imports, in the range of 26, 27 percent of, of world trade. And so uh, a, a, a significant increment. Uh, one important thing, if one is focusing on services, uh, you, you see that the trade and services of the TPP core countries, uh, apart from the United States uh, and, 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 and to a lesser extent to Singapore, is really qu quite small. So either that means that there's huge growth opportunities there, which undoubtedly will come about with, with reform over time. But it also shows you've got a small market. And a bigger market for services comes when you add countries like Japan and Korea. Uh, and indeed, this, this, this chart just shows the, the very large uh, increment in the, uh, in the uh, uh, value of trade uh, covered by the TPP when, as one goes from 8 to 13 countries. Uh, it also uh, affects the, sh the TPP share of U.S. merchandise exports, which uh, it, with, with the current, uh, with the, uh, the TPP-8, represents only 6% of U.S. exports, but w rises to 46% when you uh, deal with uh, the uh, 13 countries that, that we posited. And adding all of APEC brings the total to uh, around 60%. So that's just sort of putting things in perspective and, and indicating that Barbara's job isn't really that easy uh, as, as, one, as she led you to expect uh, in her presentation uh, this morning. But really, when you're getting into the high standard new issues and, and dealing with regulatory problems in service industries and, 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 and the like, uh, uh, it, it gets to be a, a more complicated exercise. Uh, so how do you go about crafting this TPP? Uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the one thing you don't want to do, and I think this was raised this morning, is have a big bang negotiation like we had in the Western Hemisphere with the free trade area of the Americas. Uh, my apologies to those involved in that. Uh, but uh, it was very difficult to bring in uh, a large number of countries with diverse levels of income, size, uh, uh, and, 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 and development uh, into uh, one consensus uh, agreement. And so that argues for the incremental agglomeration approach uh, 
that the uh, TPP partners uh, are currently engaged in. And indeed, they have a, uh, a, a lot to work with uh, because there is an ex extensive network of, uh, uh, of existing agreements. Uh, uh, we put together a, a, uh, a matrix of the, of the FTAs among the core and expanded TPP uh, participants. And uh, you might find this uh, actually very useful if, because it contains a, an, an incredible amount of information. Uh, because not only does it show that most of the cells of this matrix are filled, uh, but a lot of those cells are filled with what are called A, B, and Cs, uh, agreements that are already in effect, uh, signed, or where the negotiations are completed. And many more are under negotiation. So you already have a large body of commitments to liberalization, not always consistent with each other, but something to build on. And I think that is one of the things that the uh, uh, TPP negotiators are using to their advantage in trying to, uh, to, to uh, harmonize and, uh, and pull together a, an agreement over a broader geographic uh, range. Now. Uh, when one goes from TPP to FTAAP, then you have to raise a, a couple of other, other questions. How do you merge the ongoing intra-Asian integration schemes uh, with the uh, emerging or evolving trans-Pacific, uh, uh, Asia-Pacific uh, schemes? And that will require decisions uh, with regard to the broader TPP uh, membership over time. And it will also include uh, uh, a question on an issue that we really haven't touched on very much today, and that is participation of non-APEC members uh, in the evolving uh, Asia-Pacific scheme. The Japanese proposals already include India. Uh, uh, but we have a number of, but the ASEAN plus one schemes also include non-APEC members. And so how to deal with those countries, particularly where, because they raise uh, difficult development issues and political issues, uh, remains of concern. And then, because I said something bad about the FTAA, I need to say something good. We have to think about, if we're talking about a, a broader trans-Pacific uh, arrangement, how uh, some of the leading countries in Latin America might also uh, be a part of a broader scheme uh, down, down the road. Now, what's the recipe for a 21st century FTA? I think uh, that was, uh, that was uh, spelled out pretty well uh, in, in the panel and in, and in the answers to a lot of the questions. And uh, what I put down, I think, is fairly consistent uh, with what the negotiator said uh, uh, this morning. Start with the existing network of agreements and uh, build on those liberalization commitments include FTA plus provisions in areas such as food safety and security, environment, labor, and, and climate change, uh, commit to best practices and most trade promoting provisions from the pool of existing PACs. Negotiators learn by doing. And uh, if, uh, if you look at the more recent US agreements, uh, they have improved upon the FTAs that were negotiated in the 1990s or earlier uh, or a decade ago. So uh, there's a lot that can be imported uh, from the uh, extensive work that has been done by negotiators over the past decade. And uh, try to limit exceptions. Uh, as was said this morning, no agreement is going to be fully comprehensive. Uh, and the task is to try to limit the exceptions to the greatest extent possible. Uh, harmonize rules of origin. And there, there are very good precedents in uh, intra-Asian uh, uh, agreements that are more, uh, are less trade restrictive in nature uh, than some of the ones done in, the, uh, in uh, North America. Uh, and then, of course, improve the transparency of policies affecting uh, trade and investment. And that, I think, is, 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 a, is a very important factor. Uh, my time is, is, is running short, so I will uh, skip over the matrices on environmental commitments and labor commitments in, uh, in FTAs. Uh, but I did that to show that uh, the matrix is not as comprehensive uh, as the overall FTA matrix. 
And indeed, uh, in, in most of these agreements, uh, there is either uh, rather uh, bare bones side agreements or no commitments at all on labor and environment. And that's something that will need to be uh, built on. And here, the more recent US uh, uh, FTAs uh, pr contain provisions in the core text that might serve as useful uh, uh, models uh, for the uh, TPP and indeed might be improved upon uh, uh, in light of uh, climate change negotiations and negotiations on uh, environmental goods and services. Uh, rushing through because I think uh, the last uh, couple of points are, are, are important. First, can Japan join the agreement? We had a lot of discussion about that this morning. Uh, uh, but let me turn the question the other way. Can Japan afford not to join? And I think this is probably one of the things being debated in Tokyo uh, this week. Uh, Japan already has an extensive network among the extended TPP countries, among the 13 countries. FTAs are in place or under negotiation or in preparation with almost all the countries except the United States. Uh, uh, but as was noted by many speakers, the TPP will require commitments on sensitive farm products and services, and therefore there needs to be uh, some thought in terms of domestic programs in Japan that could complement the international negotiations and help provide for greater productivity in those sectors, uh, thus allowing uh, political support for uh, deregulation and liberalization. Uh, now the TPP can, can, uh, membership can provide a channel for advancing Japan-China relations, uh, which I think will go slower than some of the speakers earlier today. Uh, even though there are study groups, uh, I think uh, participation in, in TPP would accelerate that. Also interestingly, it probably would be a boost to Japan-EU ties. And I know there are, are many uh, uh, people in, in Japan that are concerned about the EU deal with Korea and other EU initiatives in the region. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, if you look at what the EU does in, in Asia, it emulates US policy. And uh, I think uh, as the TPP advances, you will see growing European interest in having a similar linkage uh, with the TPP countries. Uh, indeed, this may not happen overnight, but I think uh, sooner or later you're going to see strong European interest in uh, crafting similar types of arrangements. Uh, now, uh, membership is time sensitive. I think uh, Japan is likely to lose uh, key market access if Korea joins. Uh, the TPP, uh, which could very well happen after the Chorus FTA is ratified, uh, and if the Korea-Australia FTA is successfully uh, concluded uh, later this year or early next year. Uh, finally, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the bull in the China shop, I guess. Uh, Fred mentioned China earlier. It's, it's critical uh, to have Chinese participation in an FTAAP uh, if it is to be a credible Asia-Pacific uh, integration arrangement. And China should be interested in joining uh, because it already has strong economic relations, strong trade ties. Uh, uh, more than 40 percent of its trade is, uh, is with uh, TPP uh, uh, countries. It already has uh, bilateral pacts with uh, several, uh, uh, quite a few of the uh, uh, countries involved. In fact, uh, if you look at the list of Chinese uh, bilateral trade pacts, they include quite a few TPP participants uh, already implemented or under negotiation or with feasibility studies. So uh, uh, there are a number of, of, of economic reasons why it would be in China's interest to, uh, to, to uh, to join the party, uh, and it also would provide a better channel to resolve bilateral disputes with the United States than the uh, by doing it in a in a regional forum rather than a uh, bilaterally. Uh, uh, is it likely? Uh, I'm I'm not going to throw China into the mix and and really make uh, the negotiators' lives uh, uh, complicated uh, in the very near term. But I think uh, over the medium term, you have to think about how you how China fits into the mix if you're going to move 
from uh, uh, this uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership to a broader FTAAP. Uh, so final point, uh, I think we will see uh, over time uh, the TPP evolve significantly uh, in terms of mem membership and, uh, and I think with the substantial coverage uh, of new provisions, uh, uh, it will require many of the Asian countries to go beyond what they have included in their current uh, FTAs. Uh, this will uh, put pressure on countries to revisit exceptions in their bilateral pacts, and I mention this for, 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 for a one, one simple reason. The United States is going to be asking other countries to greatly increase the coverage of substantive obligations in their trade agreements. Uh, those countries are going to ask the industrial countries, the United States, Japan, and others, what are you going to put on the table uh, as a trade negotiator? If it was just in terms of economic welfare, you may not get that question. Uh, but they, but the U.S. doesn't have that much to put on the table. Uh, there are some services regulations that uh, could be improved. Uh, there are some trade barriers uh, that uh, could be opened, uh, if not in entirely, at least partially. And that, that will be part of the challenge uh, in building a, a high quality 21st century agreement. Uh, how do you get the biggest bang for the buck? Uh, how do you limit the exceptions? How do you open up trade to the extent possible? Uh, and that will require, uh, that will provide great gains for the United States and for other uh, TPP members. Uh, it will also require a few uh, difficult decisions in terms of uh, addressing or tackling the few remaining but important uh, trade barriers that we still maintain. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and, and thank you, uh, Mr. Hatakeyama and Fred, for, for organizing this uh, really interesting uh, discussion today. Uh, I, what I'd like to do is comment on uh, some of the points that have been made by Mr. Watanabe and also by Jeff Schott, but, but in addition to that, uh, spend a few minutes on some work that colleagues and I have underway now on, the, on, on evaluating the benefits of the TPP. Uh, that work is very prelimi preliminary, so I will only be able to give you some of the highlights of the results that are beginning to come out, but there is much, much more work to be done. The, uh, I want to begin with a point which Mr. Watanabe made, which is that uh, much of this owes its uh, history to this very important ABAC uh, um, recommendation that APEC pursue an FTAAP. Uh, and business has been uh, very much out in front of this in Japan, for example. I just came back from Japan and understand how strong a role uh, business is playing in promoting uh, participation in the TPP and more generally in, uh, in free trade areas. I wish we could say the same of American business, which also will benefit tremendously from this, uh, uh, from this agreement. Um, but in any case, the um, idea of this coming through APEC is very interesting because the U.S. will be very much at center stage uh, of the APEC process next year. And hopefully that will give us uh, some of the incentive uh, to, uh, to move this process forward. Uh, FTAP and TPP cannot be negotiated in APEC. We have learned that formal negotiations uh, in, the, in the sense of binding uh, agreements are very difficult to achieve in APEC. But they can be very much promoted by and conducted alongside APEC. And as uh, Barbara mentioned earlier, uh, some of the progress in the TPP is already owes to some of the discussions that APEC has had on the issues, on these uh, 21st century issues that the TPP is uh, introducing. Um, let me also just sort of pause for a minute about what this is really all about in the long run. It's, it's really all about knitting the Asia-Pacific region together 
into one large integrated economic area. And if one thinks about all of the changes that are underway in that region, that vision, uh, that integration, uh, has extraordinary benefits to promise uh, in terms of prosperity, in terms of economic gains, in terms of innovations, and in terms of stability. So it's that that we somehow have to keep in mind even as we try to cope with the much more detailed and complex issues that, that reaching such, a, uh, such an agreement uh, involves. Uh, having APEC in the United States may help us make this clearer to the American population as a whole. I think as long as we tend to look at issues strictly in terms of very immediate benefits in jobs in the United States, but, but sort of fail to see the larger uh, context in which these agreements and these international uh, connections are being built, uh, it will be very difficult to make the case broadly in this very complicated uh, political environment today that the United States should take the lead in trade agreements. But that case is very strong, and we have to do our best, all of us, uh, the President, but also us in the academic and the policy community, to, to make that case very broadly. And it's. Uh, to, to that extent, actually, that some of our uh, current work is aimed. Um, let me spend uh, a minute uh, on what we are trying to do, uh, on the nature of the model that we're using, uh, and then give you uh, a, a brief glimpse at some of the early results that are coming out of it. This is a joint product, by the way, of, uh, with a, a colleague at the OECD, Michael Plummer, uh, and a third colleague, uh, interesting, he is Fan Tsai. He now works for the China Investment Corporation, and his participation in that project is not part of that, uh, uh, not part of his role in the CIC. Uh, but nevertheless, I think it, it indicates the interest that Chinese economists are playing, uh, paying to this process. And that's, that's important. Jeff mentioned that. I want to come back to that uh, in a second. The model is one that we have used uh, to study the ASEAN uh, economic community. So we have already tested it in a sense, trying to understand a complex integration scheme. Although, of course, it has many different characteristics, uh, very different types of economies. But nevertheless, it's a, it's a model that we have looked at in, in various contexts and have some confidence in its, uh, in its basic structure. Uh, it, it features a number of the, of the more advanced uh, aspects that econometricians have added to trade models in recent years. It has economies of scale. It, it allows for heterogeneous producers, uh, which is a way of saying that trade actually affects the level of productivity in an economy. Uh, trade does more than simply exchange products uh, according to old patterns of comparative advantage, it can actually raise the levels of productivity in all of the economies participating in it. So we are trying to measure, in other words, we're trying to measure the benefits and the implications broadly uh, in terms not just of the traditional gains from trade, but also in terms of improvements uh, in productivity, trade facilitation, and even the gains uh, in investment that might result uh, from improving, say, IPR or access uh, uh, to, uh, 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 to markets. The model generates an annual time path, and uh, so it allows us to look uh, at how the incentives evolve for countries as they join an agreement or stay aside from it. And this is very important because all of, uh, all of our discussions so far have been very much focused on the idea that the accession of important countries can generate a kind of bandwagon effect, which ultimately ties the region more closely together. So we can actually see this. The benefits grow for the TPP as the, uh, from joining the TPP as the TPP expands. For example, if Korea is a member of the TPP, the benefits from Japan joining at that stage will be greater than before Korea uh, joined. They also change depending on what else happens uh, uh, in, on the world trading stage. For example, if the ASEAN plus three process moves forward, uh, 
the benefits for a country joining the TPP may not be as great because some of the benefits from partners that are also in ASEAN 3 would be obtained through that. So one can actually trace, by looking at the sequential nature of the decisions, one can actually trace how the TPP might involve, evolve. And it's for that reason, I think, especially interesting to see what might happen if Japan and other major economies joined early, because that would send this particular track more rapidly forward than some other tracks, which, which might also develop in its place. So that's what we are looking at. Um, the, in the baseline scenario, uh, we look at two alternatives. One is an ASEAN-based process moving forward, uh, most likely just with ASEAN plus three, but with a plus three agreement, with an agreement among the three uh, countries themselves. As you know, the CJK, the so-called China, Japan, Korea agreement, is already under study uh, and will be presented to, uh, to, the, uh, to the leaders, uh, I believe, uh, two years from now. So that there is a, 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 a dynamic to that process as well, and we study how that might evolve, and then look alongside it how the uh, uh, TPP process might evolve. Now, the initial results that we've looked at, we, we looked at TPP process evolving in three stages with only eight economies in the first stage. This was the first results we had were before Malaysia announced its, uh, its uh, participation. That agreement, hypothetically would come to fruition in 2011, would be implemented over the next four years. Then a next stage would come into force in 2015, uh, which would include 13 econ economies, including Japan, also Canada, among those that we discussed today. Uh, there is a full list. I, I have a set of slides which uh, I don't want to uh, I don't want to spend too much time on that on the screen now, but I have a set of slides which are available and which, which uh, show the detail of the 13. And then eventually in 2020, uh, TPP would expand to the 21 economies of the APAC FTAAP. So that's, those are the two paths. And then we model a wide range of reductions. We don't know, obviously, what the exact nature of the agreements are going to be. But we have pretty good estimates of barriers to trade other than in tariffs. We have reasonable estimates of barriers to trade in services. We have reasonable estimates to barriers to trade in, in the facilitation uh, area, that is, in, in non-tariff barriers that might be reduced or eliminated by trade facilitation. So we have some estimates of these, and we can make arbitrary but nevertheless plausible assumptions about how much they could be reduced. Once we have a clearer picture of the nature of the agreements, we can make these much more specific and tie them more closely to individual sectors uh, in the model. Nevertheless, we, we, we uh, include a broad range of these, and from that um, uh, get some interesting preliminary results. And I have to emphasize again, this is early. I don't even want to share the precise numbers with you, but I will give you some general feeling for, for where the results are growing. The uh, first big result is that the Trans-Pacific track is uh, the Trans-Pacific track on which the TPP moves from 8 to 13 to eventually 21 over the next 10 years, generates very substantial benefits both for uh, North and South American economies, but also very solid incremental gains for Asian economies in addition to an ASEAN plus three track. So that even if the ASEAN plus three track moves forward and a CJK agreement, difficult as it is, is a component of it, there are nevertheless very important gains to be had for all participating economies. Uh, for the U.S., these benefits eventually reach something like 1.5% of GDP, which, if you know trade models, that's really a very large number. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, not substantially below that of the benefits that we might expect, for example, from a Doha round, in part because this region is so big. It is already a very large part uh, of the global economy. The 
U.S. benefits a lot, uh, so does Japan, but the smallest economies, Vietnam and Malaysia, are, are the most obvious ones, benefit the most. And I think Mr. Watanabe's picture uh, had uh, very similar results for this. Um, Thailand would, would no doubt, Thailand has already said that it would be uh, at some point uh, very interested in participating in these negotiations along with uh, the Philippines. Uh, these economies are likely to be some of the largest beneficiaries. And dynamics matter a lot. Uh, moving from the TPP-8 to the TPP-13 would roughly quintuple the gains to the economies involved. And then moving from the TPP-13 to the FTAP, which ultimately includes the rest of Asia and China as well, would further double the gains. So this is a path which, uh, which uh, the, the speed at which we move along this path really makes a lot of difference because the benefits are very substantial. Um, interestingly, one uh, somewhat surprising effect we found is that the Asian track itself, which we felt initially might hurt the United States if the United States did not participate uh, because it would represent uh, some disadvantage in selling goods into Asian markets, does not appear to have a major effect on the U.S. Uh, and the reason for that is that some of the discrimination is balanced by the fact that Asian productivity gains would make Asian exports to the United States more productive, less costly, and would improve the terms of trade for the United States. So we would balance off some discrimination against uh, improved terms of trade. But these uh, benefits or losses are very small, and the critical gain that we see is from building the TPP eventually into the FTAP. That's what makes the big difference, and that's where, from the viewpoint of the United States, uh, the major issues lie. We also see, as a result of this model, and this will no doubt come out very uh, clearly as the negotiations deepen, significant adjustment effects. Uh, in the United States, for example, we see significant gains in agricultural production, in service production, as service markets are opened, but not so much in manufacturing. It is not a panacea for America's uh, manufacturing productivity. It is a major benefit to America's highly productive agricultural and service industries. In uh, Asian economies, we sometimes see large jumps in agricultural imports. And that raises the question of ultimately whether these agreements, uh, full 100% liberalization is politically feasible. And I'm sure those will come up very clearly, very early in the negotiations. Um, so there is much, uh, I am sure, ultimately to, uh, uh, to discuss, but the adjustments are an inevitable part of the very large gains that go with this agreement. Uh, let me uh, finally just uh, conclude with a point about uh, a comment on Jeff Schott's point about the role of China in the, in the evolving uh, uh, FTAAP process. Um, while I think it's, it's clear that uh, the feasibility of the agreement depends on the extent to which countries are ready uh, to accede to the standards that are built into the agreement. And this means that uh, there's no point for countries that are not ready to make those concessions to come in early. The other point that needs to be made is that the environment must remain very positive uh, to encourage the ultimate participation of the whole region in this project. What does that mean? Um, I think it means, first of all, being very transparent about what the rules are, about how the negotiations are proceeding, and about what the standards are that uh, countries are expected to, to meet. Uh, it means being very rigorous about what Barbara described as a living, about constructing a living agreement, which does have a path to accession that countries feel is open and accessible to them too uh, in the long run. Uh, we are facing, obviously, a very uh, difficult uh, 
period ahead with major changes in the economic gravity of different countries. And this agreement has to be seen as part of the solution that will ultimately knit the region together rather than as uh, a potential way to divide the region. So I think that's, uh, that's the critical uh, point. In terms of our estimates themselves, they show that ultimately when China is ready to join the agreement and becomes a part of it, it may well become the largest beneficiary from it. Uh, as a major exporting economy with, with, with strong assured access to uh, prosperous markets in Japan, in the United States, and elsewhere, it may very well become the largest beneficiary of this path once it is fully implemented. So it's, it's that vision that I, that, that, that I would like to argue should drive all of us in constructing a strong agreement, but one that also is able to encompass, uh, to, to stimulate growth, and to ultimately welcome all members of the Asia Pacific region in this larger uh, 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 project. Thank you. You mentioned that uh, uh, although the U.S. agriculture industry and service industry will get uh, a big benefit out of uh, 21st century's uh, FTAs or uh, FTAP, um, manufacturing sector might, may not be able to get uh, such benefit. Uh, am I wrong to understand that way? Uh, you said that uh, this is not a panacea and uh, that type of thing. Uh, I am interested in the reason for reasoning that. Mr. Petri, please. Um, the, um, these are broad sectoral aggregates that I uh, discussed. Uh, within that, there is an awful lot of variety, so that specific subsectors and particular products and particular segments of production chains might indeed uh, do very well, and I'm sure would. Um, as the specifics of the agreement become clearer, we can begin to try to model those to see where that, uh, that might take place. For example, uh, intellectual property protection may make it possible for the U.S. to develop stronger production chains in which it also develops stronger exports from, from the United States. Um, but the broad sectoral uh, aggregates, I think the United States has a uh, uh, very strong advantage in certain types of services, in business services and financial services. Uh, it has strong advantage in some agricultural products. And uh, to the extent that those sectors are liberalized, those will undoubtedly uh, be leading uh, sectors in, 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 America's, uh, in America's production profile. Uh, but um, the details are, you know, uh, the, 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 the details uh, can reach down to a very fine level, and this will not, uh, this is not a broad, uh, uh, this, this does not mean that no manufacturing sector can benefit. Indeed, many will. Thank you. Now, uh, yes, that gentleman with uh, uh, orange necktie. Yes, Greg Sheffley from U.S. Labor Department. Just to pursue on that last uh, point, um, we're talking about removing barriers to services and to try to operationalize those in a model for forecasting has been traditionally very difficult to get uh, reasonable measures. We feel somewhat comfortable about removing tariff measures. And uh, Have you done some sensitivity analysis? I know that sometimes when you assume uh, great returns for removal of services barriers, that often drives the results and uh, emphasizes a much larger gain than per perhaps one might expect. And uh, have you done sensitivity analysis to give some degree of confidence of how sensitive this is to the measures that you use to represent the removal or liberalization in the services area? Um. It's very sensitive, and uh, 
What we have not done so much is sensitivity analysis so far. What we have rather done is to try to collect various different measures, and there are several now available uh, in the literature that have been estimated that try to uh, get at the, at the, at the scale of, of distortions in services. So that provides a kind of sensitivity analysis if one spans the, the, the range of estimates that, have, that are available from the World Bank, some uh, from the Peterson Institute uh, here. Um, and there are lots of different ways to make those estimates. Some actually look at trade and see how far trade falls short of what might be a kind of envelope of how much trade there could be. Other measures uh, attempt to go from the ground up and, and, and look at what barriers there are in the way of, of, of uh, service trade and try to estimate uh, uh, restrictiveness from, from that. So one, one will have, by the end of this project, we will have a range of estimates which have to do with the range of estimates that have been made uh, of the service barriers themselves. And that lady? Yes. Thank you very much for these presentations. They're very enlightening. I'd like a little more enlightenment with two questions. One to uh, Professor Petri. Can you explain to us, just in plain English, the CGE model, some of the key characteristics of your modeling approach and, and some of the assumptions that you made? And uh, for Jeff, um, can you just deepen for us our understanding of China's bilateral trade agreements that you've listed here. How many of them are high standard FTAs, for example? Um, Wendy, you probably know CGE models better than I do, but let me, let me try to give a broad uh, uh, description of it. It is, uh, first of all, I think one important characteristic of CGE models used in trade modeling is that they assume essentially close to full employment of the labor force. In other words, they are not trying to generate additional employment in a period of recession or recovery from recession as we are in now. Rather, they look at an economy sometime in the future when hopefully we have regained full employment and then ask how much more efficiently that economy could operate, how much it could raise the welfare of consumers uh, within that economy, if it produced those goods in which it was efficient and imported those goods in which other countries were efficient, and if the barriers to this exchange were, uh, were reduced. The barriers are quite significant in services. For example, typical service barriers are estimated much higher than tariffs. Uh, the tariff equivalent of service barriers are often in the range of uh, 20 percent, for example, that, that, uh, that uh, have been estimated. So the barriers are quite significant even among economies uh, which are no longer uh, subject to significant uh, uh, tariffs. So uh, in that context, Removing those barriers, uh, regulatory barriers add similarly non-tariff costs uh, to exchanges of goods. So if you remove all of those, the potential for more efficiently arranging production uh, is, uh, is quite substantial. And that's what we are, that's what we are measuring. And those barriers uh, and the, the, the benefits from removing them are especially important for economies that are protected or distorted to begin with. And that's why economies like Vietnam, for example, have so much to gain, not only from more efficiently exchanging goods with, with their uh, trade partners, but also uh, by uh, improving their uh, domestic, uh, the domestic uh, competitiveness of their economies. <coughs> uh, Jeff Richard, please. Yeah, on, on China's uh, 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 trade agreements, Note, I never call them free trade agreements. Uh, uh, I think there, uh, there was a perception uh, dating back to some of the earlier uh, Chinese agreements with the ASEAN that were uh, pursued primarily for political reasons uh, uh, more than a decade ago. Uh, and that can most politely be called shallow integration arrangements uh, with limited coverage. 
that is not the model that has been adopted more recently. And uh, if you look at the China-New Zealand uh, free trade agreement, and there are people in the room who are much more expert than I on it, uh, it, it goes much further. And so uh, I suspect that uh, uh, in areas like uh, educational services and other areas, uh, that could be one of the agreements where uh, negotiators may find some useful precedents. Uh, and uh, uh, the fact that China uh, is beginning to, conclu uh, uh, to uh, conclude agreements like that, I think will help in the uh, uh, transition process for moving from the big outsider to uh, a country that uh, uh, can uh, hopefully uh, be more involved uh, uh, in, the, in the coming years in the actual negotiations and participate and implement uh, a high standard agreement. Uh, the lady in the same table, yeah. Uh, thank you very much to the panel. I'm Sherry Stevenson from the Organization of American States. and. Uh, Thanks to Jeff in particular for his comments on the FTAA. We're, we're sad it didn't come to fruition, and uh, we hope the FTAP will draw lessons so that this would be a more successful process. And in that context, I was intrigued by both Jeff's remarks and Peter's remarks that it's perhaps better not to go in a big bang approach, but to go incrementally. But the incremental uh, approach involves, in your presentations, multiple pathways. and. Uh, Peter mentioned two and Jeff mentioned three, although two of Jeff's three are both ASEAN-centric because they're both basically built out from ASEAN. And then the third one involves, of course, the United States through the uh, TPP. And I just want you to maybe probe a little bit more the implications of, of how are we supposed to know which one of these. Is this competitive liberalization through different pathways? Is, as, is it going to be a leadership struggle between whoever goes forward first fastest, ASEAN or the United States. Um, clearly, looking at the charts that Peter Petri has in his presentation, the US gains through the TPP track, and Japan gains through the TPP track with Japan, but presumably Japan could also gain through the second ASEAN track, uh, 10 plus 6, or even ASEAN-centric 10 plus 3. So, the question is, how are countries going to decide in what eggs do they put their basket? And when will the United States realize that actually this process could benefit from its leadership? Mr. Schott, please. Well, Sherry, that's a very good question. And uh, I think uh, what you've done is, is, is put Peter on, on, on notice here, uh, that uh, the pathway isn't necessarily a straight line extrapolation. <laughs> uh, at least that's not the way it's going to happen in, in, in practice. Uh, in one sense, we have competitive liberalization. It's alive and well and living in East Asia. And that's why I brought in the European Union because they are engaging in competitive liberalization with the United States and with China and Japan and, and Korea and ASEAN. Uh, that said, there are different approaches to integration. Uh, and the traditional Asian approach uh, has been more consensus-oriented, shallow integration building up as the Chinese have begun to learn to uh, craft better agreements in economic terms. Uh, going against the more uh, 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 legalistic, juridical approach of, of the United States where you want hard obligations uh, in, in, uh, in, measure, in large measure to ensure a uh, policy predictability uh, that will encourage investment, and, and the gains come from, uh, from the productivity-enhancing investments. Uh, uh, if I were to look at what's happening, I'd say the U.S. approach is gaining favor uh, around the world, uh, in, 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 and for the, for the reason because there is such a competition for, for the investment. 
but how how do, how do you deal with this uh, en enlarging uh, TPP and the non uh, participants in the APEC region who will who you will want to bring in uh, at uh, uh, I think if you have a high standard TPP, uh, uh, part of the process will be adjustment measures for the new members or the candidates coming in. Uh, part of it will uh, uh, will be, as, as as Barbara mentioned, having a a living agreement that you can adapt to the expanding membership uh, to ensure that you can over time reap the gains. Uh, so uh, I, I would bet on the, uh, uh, on, on, the, on the TPP model being the dominant one, uh, but when you're dealing with some of the smaller, uh, poorer countries in ASEAN, you, you may have to have some uh, incremental approaches to, to, to uh, integration uh, moving forward uh, once, it, once you move from TPP to broader APEC-wide uh, uh, arrangements. But that's certainly uh, political scientists need to look at uh, more closely, but you're talking uh, five years out or more uh, before you start that process, in my view. Uh, Mr. Hogan, please. Uh, a little bit contrary to that very last thing you said, Jeff, um, you were very good in your presentation to talk about the possible implications for China and of China. Suppose China surprised us. Suppose they got up at Yokohama in three weeks and said, President Hu Jintao gets up and says, we've studied this uh, TPP thing very closely. We think it's very interesting. We apply for membership. Well, you could imagine several reasons for that. They might want to deflect attention away from the big debate on currency. They might want to scoop Japan, which may be coming in itself. They may want to affect the model before it gets too far down the road and think, wow, better now than later uh, if we're going to come into this thing. So suppose China did that, or even over the next year sometime. Would that kill TPP, or, or would it save it? Would it all of a sudden then make it really interesting and really galvanize attention and really generate enormous focus and maybe provide a whole new thrust? Or as I say, would it kill it? And poor Wendy would have to say, uh, Barbara I mean, Barbara, Barbara and Wendy <laughs> would have to say, hmm, not sure Congressman Brady even could stomach that one. Um, which way would it go? What's your best judgment uh, among the panelists? I'll, I'll start. I, I, I think I, I, I'm very sure of this. The first impact would be Barbara would resign and uh, <laughs> take early retirement. <laughs> um, I think uh, it would kill it uh, for the very reason. I think I think back uh, uh, 15, 16 years ago, I was teaching a course at Princeton. And uh, I, I asked uh, the class to pick a country and pretend they were the trade representative and what would be involved in having a trade agreement uh, with the United States, FTA, along the NAFTA model. And I had one, one of the students was a middle management uh, a career official from METI, METI at the time. And he gave a very good analysis of the pros and cons, the economic benefits. And then he said, in conclusion, it won't happen. He said, regardless of any of this economic analysis, because it doesn't pass the smell test. And no one would believe at that time that the United States and Japan could have a free trade agreement because nobody trusted to have secure market access in, in Japan. Right now, if you have a, uh, uh, a negotiation with China, all of the concerns about hidden barriers, unfair trade, subsidy, hidden subsidies, state-owned enterprises, all of that would say, uh, they can say free trade, but it won't be. Uh, and, uh, and politically, it would be a non-starter, in my view. Uh, 
Well, uh, it, as I understand it, uh, you can't get into the uh, negotiations unless there's a consensus among all the uh, current participants. And so uh, you'd probably have a long drawn out study, uh, which is the Asian way of, of doing this, which can either produce uh, progress or can be used internally to delay uh, the advent of negotiations. Educated guess. Yes. Nick, Nick. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, if China was serious about ultimately joining the TPP, not necessarily right away, but if it view, viewed the FTAP as a desirable long-term outcome, and I think it should because everything about the structure of the benefits would, uh, would, would argue for that, then that's probably not the strategy they would or should follow. I think another strategy might be to come closer to the agreement, to, to study it, to talk to the people involved in it, uh, to try to work on the accession uh, clauses in, in the agreement that might make it possible for them gradually uh, to become ready and to, and to play a larger role. I think uh, having some influence on the shape of it, but recognizing that this is not the time, uh, might be a might be a good way uh, for them and for the rest of the region, for that matter, to deal with the problem that this is uh, a very important economy that ultimately has to play a central role in the region's trading system. So I, I think there are solutions to this, and maybe that may, maybe Barbara is talking to them now, but we don't know about it. So. But I, I would hope that there is a discussion going on about about how that would play out without the disruptive uh, scenario that you've described. Do you have any comment at this stage? No. Uh, I think uh, China is the would be the last country to join uh, TPP, uh, which is different from FTAP at this stage, and uh, because. TPP is uh, seeking for very high standard of liberalization. And uh, as you know, China is restricting its export of uh, rare earth, for example. And uh, it's not in the interest of uh, China joining uh, TPP at this particular juncture. So it will not happen. Uh, Mr. Hu Jintao will not stand up uh, uh, three weeks after today. Uh, yes. yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I, I have the same opinion, but uh, uh, there might be a way, something like a provisional license. Uh, the ASEAN way is the opposite of TPP, but uh, there should be uh, some other uh, pathways of, uh, in between. So uh, the apex uh, way of thinking is uh, something uh, having uh, best practice and template, and uh, to, re to, to achieve each uh, template as a best practice, and finally getting but so there might be a kind of a something like a provisional license. Have, have the Chinese members of ABAC shown any interest? I have no idea, but uh, uh, they have no objection that uh, we put on the FTAP. There are pathways, uh, four pathways. In the recommendation, we have uh, rec acknowledged four pathways. One is ASEAN plus one and ASEAN plus three, ASEAN plus six, and TPP. So in that sense, uh, that wording has been acknowledged. That lady, yes. Hello, my name is Nami Yoshio from Kyodo News. Um, I have two specific questions on Japan. Um, on Japan. Um, the first one Could you is speak more loudly? Yes. Um, I have two specific questions in Japan. The first one is, um, what kind of obstacles 
um, are there for Japan in joining the TPP um, kind of reforms or domestic reforms are necessary um, for them to join, such as um, for their exports in rice or um, wheat, sugar, beef, um, also some areas in the postal reform. Um, and my second question is, um, I believe earlier this year, Japan has requested to participate in the um, discussions as an observer, but has been refused um, for that. And so if you know of anything that went on in the um, discussions between the Japanese governments, um, please kindly advise. Thank Your you. question is d d directed to whom? Um, to all of all three. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Watanabe, please. Yeah, uh, the, I think major uh, issues, uh, agriculture issue, I believe. Uh, and the other, uh, of course, uh, there are many other issues. I think if, as uh, I, I'm not uh, quite familiar to the details of TPs, itself, but uh, very high standard uh, agreement, uh, including uh, services. Uh, uh, Japan has uh, still a lot of uh, uh, regulation on services in industries like healthcare, education, and so and so. So uh, maybe uh, those are uh, things uh, which we need a kind of a, a big change or reform of the industries. Uh, I, I couldn't catch the uh, second questions. Observer. Observer status in the negotiations. I have no, no, <laughs> no I have no, uh, uh, I, I haven't uh, had any, uh, I think, substantial information on that. Next question. Yes, uh, this gentleman. Thank you. Um, I'm Tom Oku, Bank of Tokyo, Mitsubishi UFJ in Washington, D.C. Uh, my question to uh, Jeff and perhaps uh, Professor Petri about a uh, little fundamental question. How, how are you gonna, going to persuade the suspicious um, congressman or senator for a free trade agenda like TPP or the other um, items? I mean, th to ratify those um, agreement, it, needs a lot of uh, votes and always uh, we, we discussed uh, the TPP subject today and it's always good to promote uh, free trade but always we need to, to be practical to how to pass the, um, the those agendas at um, uh, House or Senate and um, the, the reason why I want to ask is um, um, perhaps Japan needs the best way to uh, persuade the suspicious press, suspicious uh, representatives, and we, so perhaps Jeff uh, have a lot of opportunity to um, uh, testify before the Congress, and perhaps you need you have some some uh, agenda or some couple of words to uh, persuade those persons suspicious for free trade. Um, the today uh, um, Congressman um, said uh, even if the a Republican turnover of a house, or, e or even with, or with, with that, the uh, uh, GOP is uh, rather positive for spending money on job training or education uh, in promoting free trade agenda. I think that's an uh, encouraging statement. Um, everyone thinks um, um, the GOP turnover may have rather positive effect, uh, although they are always, spend, uh, always saying uh, no more spending, no more spending. So, so I think it maybe have some um, positive aspect of it, but always there is suspicious person, and the, um, I, I'm always wondering uh, to very hard to promote the free trade agenda in uh, even in even in the United States and of course in Japan. So, uh, what's your always say uh, your fundamental message to those um, representatives? Uh, I think the, the, the first, first point to make 
is that when Congress uh, uh, puts together implementing legislation for uh, trade agreement, what they are focusing on are the requirements that uh, 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 to change U.S. laws that would uh, would result from the trade agreement. Uh, and so uh, when you're looking at a 21st century agreement, if uh, a good part of the agreement is bringing countries up to U.S. standards or Japanese standards, industrial country standards, then there, uh, uh, there's less that re is required in terms of changes in, in, in U.S. practices. Uh, in fact, if you look at our recent trade agreements, uh, they're focusing on, you know, the, 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 the few border measures, in large measure, that have survived uh, years and years of, 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 of trade negotiations. Uh, so uh, uh, you will always have that. And uh, one of the challenges for the United States will be uh, we have some restrictions in some service uh, industries. Uh, we still maintain some agricultural restrictions that have been uh, in whole or part exempted from our past agreements. And there will be pressure to change that uh, in whole or part, uh, to either remove the restrictions entirely or to open up a more of the US, US market. Uh, that will require uh, enough uh, benefits on the table to uh, generate the political support that would offset the criticism from the protected industry. Uh, and uh, that, uh, uh, that, will, uh, uh, that will be uh, part of the negotiator's calculation of what can be given uh, and, how, 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 and, and how much needs to be on the table uh, before a deal can be done. That's the problem in the Doha round right now. There's not enough on the table to generate the pro-trade support to offset the rather small but very loud and influential agricultural interests that don't want their subsidies cut. Uh, one, one final point on, uh, on uh, trade adjustment assistance. Uh, the Congress is going to be very strict on, uh, on new spending. Uh, at least they... Uh, they should be, in a, in a, given the, the projections of our, our deficits going forward. But it's not very well known that in the economic stimulus legislation in February 2009, that legislation include, included the biggest reform and enhancement of the TAA program in, what, 40 years uh, uh, since it started. So a, a, a huge expansion covering service industry workers, uh, much more money, uh, uh, modified programs. So uh, there, 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 there is the ability to do more to uh, help the adjustment of, uh, 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 of workers. And uh, it, uh, it, it's gotten drowned in the fact that we've had almost 10% unemployment. So as the employment situation hopefully improves, albeit too slowly f uh, to suit uh, the Obama administration, uh, we will see that uh, th those types of programs uh, uh, being uh, at the margin more, more useful in the political process. Could I add something to that? Yes. Uh, everything Jeff said is absolutely right, but I'd like to add two things. Um, I think there are two compelling arguments for the TPP which give it a good chance of winning congressional approval. They were the same two arguments that convinced President Obama and the administration to enter into the talks a year ago when they had done nothing positive on trade until that time and they wanted to avoid trade policy but they felt they could not continue to avoid it in this context. And there were two arguments that I think persuaded them to proceed. And I think the same two arguments could be convincing with the Congress. The first is the prospect of significant discrimination against U.S. trade 
from Asia-only economic agreements. If the architectural outcome is for the pan-Asian agreements without the United States, even a congressman can realize that that's pretty stupid for the United States, particularly if those same Asian countries are making deals with the EU, our other big trade competitor. So if everybody else is doing deals with each other and only the U.S. is left outside, it's actually pretty stupid for the United States. And that, I think, is a fairly compelling economic argument that could be persuasive. The second and, I think, even more important uh, uh, aspect is the broader <coughs> foreign policy and national security argument that Kurt Campbell was making this morning. I mean, he reports that everybody in Asia says that the U.S. is going to be left out of Asia if it does not move ahead with economic arrangements and that China will be left <coughs> to dominate the region. This was an argument that Lee Kuan Yew made very powerfully when he came to the United States last fall. In fact, I don't know if you're aware, Lee Kuan Yew met with President Obama shortly before he went to Asia. And more forcefully than anyone else could, Lee Kuan Yew simply said, in so many words, if the United States continues to stay on the sideline, China is going to dominate Asia. Do you want that to happen? And Obama did not. And I don't think the Congress would. So and, and it's important to remember that U.S. trade policy, at the end of the day, is always determined by broader U.S. foreign policy and national security concerns. Everything, including NAFTA, has followed that pattern. So the economics have to be at least neutral or hopefully positive. But it's foreign policy and national security that eventually determine the outcome. And I think that will be true here, too. Now, it would take a major effort to sell those arguments and convince the Congress, overcome the fears about greater competition from the Asian countries. Uh, but I think that's a doable proposition. And um, it obviously does require an administration and congressional leadership, like Congressman Brady, that would uh, place high priority on the issue and make the case effectively. But I think the case is there. So uh, I would not despair by any means that this particular negotiation uh, would be carried through to ratification by the Congress. I think the case is much more persuasive than even the Korea-US Free Trade Agreement, where I think the same arguments apply, but not as broadly and so not as persuasively, though I think they'll prevail in the Korea case too, probably within the next six to 12 months. Um, but I think with TPP, U.S. relation with Asia as a whole, it's, it's going to be widely realized this is very big stuff from a U.S. standpoint. And therefore, uh, I think uh, the effort is, uh, is not only critically important, but very promising in the terms you put it carrying it through to final approval and implementation. I think Barbara was exactly right. Uh, you don't want to pursue something like this unless you think uh, it will eventually pass muster in the Congress with the public. Uh, but I think this one will. I think the arguments are very powerful. And um, so I would be optimistic that uh, if they can negotiate it uh, effectively, that, uh, that it will win approval here. And I would suspect fairly widespread approval. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Toyoda, please. Th thank you very much for um, your um, explanation about prospects for an FDTA. Um, since uh, we are not talking about TPP, uh, um, we are talking about uh, prospects for uh, FDAP, uh, I am tempted to ask you about the role of uh, economic uh, cooperation 
um, when we talk about TPP, we simply talk about trade liberalization or investment liberalization, and, and, and that is perhaps sufficient. But when we talk about uh, um, uh, FTAAP, FTAP, uh, uh, we have to think about uh, um, many economies would join, and, and the level of economic development differs. Um, well, I don't know whether you think about uh, um, the poorest country in Asia. Um, well, fortunately, um, uh, uh, Myanmar is not a part of uh, uh, APEC, uh, but, but uh, uh, um, say uh, Peru might uh, not be a rich country. And, and, and when we think about uh, um, uh, uh, FDAP, we have to think about uh, uh, somehow narrowing the gap of uh, uh, economic development. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, simply the market mechanism would destroy uh, poor countries. Well, that's one of the reasons why uh, East Asian economic uh, cooperation is, is uh, uh, variable for uh, poor uh, countries. And, 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 and for instance, uh, infrastructure improvement, that we have to uh, provide uh, uh, financial assistance uh, to um, um, uh, improve the railroad, uh, roads, and bridges, et cetera, et cetera. Otherwise, simply market mechanism or uh, trade liberalization, investment liberalization, would leave those uh, poor countries out of uh, uh, the scene. Um, well, now we are talking about prospects for uh, FDAP. Uh, I'm just uh, tempted to ask uh, about the role of uh, economic cooperation, particularly um, Martin Abesan, I understand uh, as uh, ABAC, uh, you must uh, have discussed this sort of issue. Uh, but but uh, uh, Professor Petri, uh, you may have uh, sort of calculated uh, the economic impact uh, of, of this kind on uh, various countries and, and, and then simply liberalization itself might not uh, be sufficient. How do you characterize the, the, the importance of uh, uh, economic uh, uh, assistance in this uh, uh, context? Thank you. Uh, thank you. As uh, ABAC this year uh, had a theme that uh, sustainable growth for all, and uh, uh, the major, uh, I think, uh, apex uh, uh, effort is uh, to eliminating the poverty uh, or decreasing uh, the number of poor people by way of financial inclusion and uh, uh, financial support for SMEs and so and so. And uh, uh, I, I think APEC uh, in the past and uh, right now also having a uh, focus on economic and uh, technology cooperation. So in that sense, uh, uh, I'm very much uh, interested that uh, TPP include, uh, as you mentioned, Peru, or Vietnam, where uh, there are many so-called uh, poverty line, below the poverty line people. So. Uh, in that sense, uh, the apex uh, 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 ecotex uh, uh, type of idea should be maintained. That's uh, my uh, my view. Quickly comment on that. I think the first point is 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 the one that Mr. Watanabe just observed that TPP already has in it some of the features of capacity building and and technical assistance that, uh, as, as we understood from Barbara earlier, uh, that might contribute to this uh, uh, issue. But I think the, 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 the answer is that FTAAP has to be part of a context of a much richer regional cooperation architecture in which you do have uh, APEC perhaps uh, acting uh, to provide capacity building uh, activities of various sorts. You have Asian Development Bank. Uh, you have ASEAN, which itself is, is, is addressing some of these issues through uh, special devices with which other uh, trade partners might become more deeply involved. So there is a, a much richer set of architectures within which those issues need to be addressed. And, and 
probably could be if, if regional integration proceeds at a very rapid pace. Now the last quest short question, if uh, any. If there is no other questions, I'd like to express my gratitude to those panelists and discussant for them, to them, for having done a very good job. Thank you very much. The, uh, the hour is late, we've had a long day, uh, so uh, I at least will make my share of this final session mercifully short. Uh, I'll make a few lead off remarks, I'll turn it to uh, Dr. Hadakiyama. You can ask as many questions as you want, but, uh, and we'll treat this as a wrap up session to try to pull together some of the lessons of the day. Uh, I will make only four points and they all come by way of conclusions from what we've discussed today, but couched particularly in terms of where I would like to see the process, the TPP slash FTAP process now go. First, all trade negotiations need a deadline. Barbara and Mark and their colleagues will go on interminably unless their political masters force them to come to a conclusion at some uh, some uh, plausible and credible deadline. The Doha round has never had a credible deadline. They always set deadlines, but none of them were really ever meaningful in substantive terms, and so the negotiations go on interminably. We need a credible deadline. That deadline, I think, should and actually is the U.S. summit, the U.S. hosting of the 2011 APEX summit in Hawaii a year from now. So at this year's summit, I would recommend strongly that the leaders set that as a deadline, instruct their negotiators to reach a conclusion in time so that they can announce the deal in Hawaii in November of 2011. That's a credible deadline because President Obama has a vested interest in that outcome. It's his hometown, it's his home state. It's not just his country, it's his home everything. And so he wants to go down in history with the Obama agreement to replace the Bogor goals and make this a truly uh, legacy from his presidency. If the things I said before are right, that this could then be sold to the Congress, it would actually be a very major step forward, not just for U.S. trade policy, not just for U.S. economic interests, but for U.S. foreign policy, national security, and participation in the whole Asian region. So I think it's credible. Uh, I think it's necessary to force the negotiators to a conclusion. And so my recommendation number one is that Yokohama should set a deadline of Hawaii to reach initial agreement on the TPP comprising uh, whatever core group is ready to go at that time. Recommendation two based on at least my own study and experience of uh, trade negotiations over a number of years, big is better. In other words, you got to make it worthwhile. As Jeff said uh, earlier, that's been the problem with the Doha round. Even Congressman Brady, who as you can tell, is the most fervent supporter of trade liberalization of Congress, even Congressman Brady said, there's not enough in Doha now got to be bigger, got to be expanded. That explains why there's been so little U.S. interest in the Doha outcome. There are no corporate CEOs beating on the door of congressmen to get the Doha round completed. Indeed, they care more about the free trade agreement with Panama than they care about the Doha round. Sounds strange, but there's more in it for them. And so it's got to be big enough to count. 
and that means expanding the membership at least to the core group of 12 or 13 as soon as possible to get into this first tranche that I've talked about. Now, some people may say my first two principles are inconsistent. I want a deal by a year from now, and I want more countries in it. I don't think it's inconsistent. It is challenging. It does mean you need to bring in these new actors pretty quickly, like three weeks from now at Yokohama. I'm hoping that our Japanese colleagues here will go back from this conference infused with zeal to bring their government fully into participation in the TPP negotiations forthwith. That, of course, will uh, uh, induce the other countries at the margin to come along as well. Korea is pending the chorus uh, ratification here, but hopefully, we hear Brady, that may happen in the next six months. They could come in quickly, I think, once uh, that happened. So I think the two points, while challenging, are compatible, and they would be my first two recommendations. Third, no preconditions, but everything on the table. I think that's been the consensus of the discussion so far. Um, it does raise the question of whether the position that um, Barbara enunciated for the United States is quite right, saying that we maintain, and the implication was we maintain only the market access commitments from the previous FTAs. If you really put everything on the table, it does mean sugar from Australia. It does mean rice into Korea or Japan. So it does mean a broader negotiating package than would be the case from simply replicating the existing FTAs. I leave that to the negotiators, but I think it is correct to proceed and may be necessary to achieve my earlier objectives to avoid preconditions but put everything on the table. Um, it will inevitably lead, at some point, that principle could clash with my prior principle of maximizing the number of countries because some countries may only be able to participate actively and successfully if there are some exceptions. Uh, the U.S. took things off the table with Australia. Korea took things off the table with the United States. Um, if it comes to a trade-off between purity of the agreement and broadened membership, I'm in agreement with what hatakiyama san said in our conference here back in 2007. One should resolve those differences in favor of broader membership. That's not, of course, to say gut the agreement, permit wide uh, uh, deviations from the group consensus, but if it comes to a trade-off at the margin between exceptions for one or two sectors versus keeping a major country in the deal, uh, I would go for the latter in terms of the broader economic impact and broader security and foreign policy payoff that would result. Fourth and finally, um, I'm delighted that we got such a consensus today, and apparently in the negotiations, of maintaining the link between TPP and ultimate FTAP. Uh, the fact that at least all the current participating countries see the TPP as a stepping stone to the free trade area of the Asia Pacific, I think is extremely healthy, um, both for the end game, but also for the negotiations, because if China and others who may stay outside this first core, first core group um, believe that the core group credibly intends to keep pushing toward a comprehensive agreement with all APEC members, uh, that increases their incentives to come in sooner rather than later. Uh, that's the kind of healthy incentive you want to generate in negotiations themselves. And so that link to the eventual FTAP, I think, is very constructive. I applaud the negotiators for doing that. I suspect there have been some short-term political temptations to, uh, to kind of ignore that in favor of minimizing uh, possible adverse reactions in parliaments around the world. Uh, but I 
think the fact that they've held on to that longer term vision is highly desirable. Um, if they were able to achieve an initial agreement by a year from now, as I would advocate, uh, then I think it's not so implausible that they could expand to an FTAP kind of concept over the next three to five years. And voila, the original Bogor goal of achieving free trade in the Asia Pacific region by 2020 would be achieved. Then Barbara could retire in good graces <laughs> with a full success on her plate and the world would be a much better place. So those would be my four objectives, very modest, very mild, I think all doable, and now we'll see what Haruki Yamasan has to say. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bergsten. If everything is put on the table, then uh, we have to accept there is no exception, at least from the first place. But uh, uh, this would imply that uh, in the end of the negotiation, uh, there may be some exceptions coming out, as sugar in the case of the U.S., I don't know, uh, in the dairy products of some country, or rice in Japan, uh, those type of things might be there, but uh, uh, these uh, uh, things should not be exempted from the first place. Thirdly, in exchange for this um, ruling out uh, exceptions, uh, ruling out preconditions is also necessary. Uh, if uh, uh, everything is put on the table, then uh, uh, preconditions type of thing should be negotiated through the negotiations because they would be put on the table. Uh, fourthly, mm, high standard is necessary. I understood very clearly that uh, high standard is necessary for uh, being a TPP member. However, in Japan, there is a proverb saying that uh, if the water in the pond is too cle clean, then the fish cannot live. <laughs> and uh, and uh, the same is true uh, with uh, uh, this uh, TPP game. And uh, so uh, please arrange the environment where fish can live. The uh, fifth one is minor one, but uh, important one is that uh, <coughs> although we have not discussed on this po uh, specific point, uh, in the Hanoi Declaration uh, back in 2006, uh, FTAP was uh, for the first time mentioned, but uh, it was mentioned as a long-term perspective perspective. Uh, but uh, 10 years from now would not be too long term, maybe mid term. So the wording of this Hanoi uh, Declaration of Leaders, APEC leaders, should be uh, amended at least from long-term perspective to mid-term perspective. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, cooperation. Thank okay, you. floor is open for comments, questions, alternative interpretations, and uh, advice on where things should go. Well, as I said, it's been a long day. <laughs> with uh, <laughs> and late late in the day um, if nobody has any comments <laughs>
Uh, I will then take the liberty of joining with my co-host, uh, Hadaki Yamasan, to give you all a little time off for good behavior, uh, to leave early. Uh, I would simply conclude by thanking Hadaki Yamasan again for inspiring this conference, suggesting it, uh, and particularly suggesting to co-host it again with us at the Institute. We're delighted to have done that.